Professor Julian Gold is coming up to the podium and I'd like to introduce him. He's a senior staff specialist at Prince of Wales Hospital and has been involved with the World Health Organisation in a collaborative centre and for the last 25 years has looked after patients with HIV AIDS and as Matthew said, he's looking for a new job, hence the Lighthouse Project and he's the lead investigator in that. Welcome Julian and thank you very much for giving up Saturday afternoon. Uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for inviting me here. It's always tempting to respond to comments that I have nothing to do. Um, <clears throat> but in fact, we look after about 3,000 people with HIV and um, it's far from nothing to do. But uh, my interest in motor neuron disease now goes back a number of years and uh, I think that Matthew gave a very good overview of where the treatments for motor neurone disease are at. And I think the common factor with all of the trials that are going on are really based on trying to intervene in the history of motor neurone disease, whereas really my interest is to look at the potential cause for motor neurone disease as an infectious disease uh, clinician. Uh, it's always more productive to try to find the cause of an infection and treat that at the beginning rather than trying to treat the implications of that infection. But clearly, of course, if you don't know the cause, then the best that can be done is to try to intervene along the natural history. So what I'll do in the next uh, 15 minutes or so is to give you a little background as to the thinking behind this and how the, uh, the Lighthouse study came about. Um, to begin with, I'd like to be able to give you the results of the Lighthouse study, but in fact, the last patient only finishes this week. And I'll show you a little bit of the problems that I have. Unlike many other studies that are funded to millions of dollars by pharmaceutical companies, where they come along and give you a protocol, they've got armies of PhDs doing the analysis and setting it all up. In fact, this is what's called an investigator-initiated study, where essentially um, a couple of investigators, me, spent really much of my time designing it and getting it underway with, um, with direct involvement clearly of, uh, of the co-principal investigators, uh, as Matthew said, him, Dominic Rowe, Steve Vucek and Susan Mathers in Melbourne. Okay, so in order to understand this, uh, first of course, uh, this project would never have happened without I think the initiative and foresight and creativity um, in funding these type of studies of the MNDRIA and the Fight MND uh, Foundation, which I think are pretty unique in Australia and I think we should be pleased that we've got these organisations supporting us. As Matthew alluded to, it's not simple. HIV is relatively simple. We know that there's a, uh, a virus. Uh, we know if we kill the virus or get uh, or enable to inhibit it, people don't get AIDS. But motor neurone disease isn't like that, and that's why well over 250 clinical trials that have been done over the past 20 or 30 years have really produced no important advances in altering the natural history of the disease. So it's complex. And I guess that in some ways is a challenge. What we know is that there are lots of viruses that act on the nervous system. There's a whole list of viruses, of course, not necessary to go into it, but we know there are many, many viruses that have a direct effect on the nervous system, as well as other areas of the body. We know also that there are really two types of viruses. Okay, there's one virus that or type of virus that is transmitted in the air. So the flu, um, through food, hepatitis, there's measles, mumps, uh, polio, all of those viruses are just transmitted, uh, not really using person-to-person -person transmission. But there is a very interesting family of viruses that are really only transferred by direct 
person-to-person -person transmission. And this family of viruses are called retroviruses. And this is what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. And they are transmitted either um, by sexual contact, mother to child, or genetically. Okay, so they're transmitted genetically. And the most common virus we know about is HIV. Now, we need to appreciate a little bit about our chromosomes. And we know that our chromosomes are made up of the double helix that we all, that Watson and Crick discovered, and all of our chromosomes are made up of this, the ACTG uh, double helix. And what they found when they mapped the human genome, which was in uh, the early 2000s, is that we have around 3 billion base pairs. So the ACTG, those little base pairs, we have 3 billion of those in our chromosomes. And we only use 2%, only 2% of all of those uh, base pairs in order to transmit all of our genetic material from one generation to the next. All this is really quite amazing. So then the question is, what happens to the other 98%? Okay, so what they found, which was completely unexpected in mapping the human genome, is in fact 8% of our genes are actually made up of viral DNA, viruses that infected all of these species over the past 40 million years and are really one of the keys to Darwinian survival of the fittest. So what they found is that over the past 40 million years, certain viruses infected species and then one of two things happened. Either they died or these viruses were incorporated into their genes. They actually became part of our genes. And one of the viruses that we know about today is HIV. HIV's infected 60 million people around the world. Some people die and some people survive. What we know is that these special type of viruses, okay, they'll infect one or two individuals, those individuals that survive, and the virus gets integrated, becomes part of their genes. Over time, over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, or even millions of years, those genes are passed on from generation to generation until now they are part of the whole population. So each one of us, every, every homo sapien, every human on this planet has 8% of your genes which are composed of viral DNA which infected species up to 40 million years ago. So, the question then is, what do they do? What do these viral DNA that make up 8% of our genes, do they do anything? Are they just junk? Do they just lie there? So that's been a question that people have now been trying to answer for the last 10, or almost 15 years. And there are only a few groups in the world that are actually looking at this. There's a group in London that I work with, a group in the Netherlands that I work with, and one group in the United States. So the question is, can these uh, viruses, which are part of our genes, can somehow they be turned on? Can they be activated? And if they're activated, what do they do? And that's the question that interests me. The answer is yes, they can be turned on. And the virus that most recently infected species is a virus called HERV-K, 
human endogenous retrovirus type K. And it would take me another couple of hours to go into the whole details behind that, which I don't have. But clearly you can see here a cell and coming off that cell are these little viral particles and they are actually viral particles of this particular virus called HERV-K. And it's HERV-K that I'm going to talk to you about now. Okay, so what we know is that HERV-K, this particular virus that's part of our DNA, is actually in every one of our chromosomes. So it forms part of our chromosomes all throughout all of our DNA. Okay, so it's all over the place. And again, we can see uh, HERV-K actually being upregulated. So the question is, what happens when it gets upregulated? Well, what we know is that HERV-K, when it's upregulated, has a particular propensity for infecting motor neurons. Okay, for infecting motor neurons. And in fact, if you have a look at cross sections of motor neurons in people with MND, you actually see on increasing close ups particular staining for HERV K in the motor neurons. Now, is this just coincidence? Is it just a, an observation? Or does it mean more than, than that? Well, a group at the National Institute of Health in Washington, led by uh, Professor Avindra Nath, who's been working on this now for many, many years, answered that question, or partially answered that question, a couple of years ago, and published a landmark paper. And what he did is he took a wild-type mouse and he took a bit of the HERV-K and he integrated that HERV-K into the genome of this wild-type mouse. And the wild-type mouse developed motor neurone disease. Very interesting. And the first time that anybody has actually been able to take one of these viruses that are part of our DNA and actually cause a disease. And he did that. And that's very interesting. So what I'm interested in is the issue that these particular viruses are really broadly of the same family as HIV. This other virus that I've been working on for so many years. So the question is, can the drugs that we use for HIV maybe have some impact on motor neurone disease? Because these drugs, as Matthew alluded to, and the reason I have nothing to do, is <laughs> that they're actually magic drugs. They're really the penicillins of the 21st century. They've taken millions of people who would otherwise die, and now these people lead a relatively normal lifespan. Now just imagine if in the 1930s, 40s, when they discovered penicillin, if they'd only used penicillin for staph infection and not tried it for anything else, we would all be dead. The reason basically that we're here is that some people said, okay, this antibiotic works against this organism, let's try it against other organisms. And they did, and they found it worked. That's my interest. Can these magic drugs for HIV actually work against another illness, given what we know or the theories about what might be the cause of motor neurone disease? So, in order to do that, we need to go through this in a step-by-step -step way. The first thing we need to do is to find out if you give these drugs that we use for HIV to people with motor neurone disease, are they safe? And are they well tolerated? 
because whatever drugs you give to people, they can have different effects. And we know that people with motor neurone disease, as with other illnesses, can tolerate drugs or not. So the first thing that we did was that we selected four sites, one at Prince Alfred, at the Brain and Mind Centre, one at Macquarie University, one at Westmead, and one at Calvary in Melbourne. Each site enrolled 10 patients very quickly. And they, we observed those people for three months, and then we treated them for six months. OK, so we observed them without treatment, and then we treated them for six months. And we used a combination antiretroviral drug called Triomec that Matthew put up, which is actually three drugs in one tablet, and it's one tablet once a day. And that's very appealing, one tablet once a day. So we looked at the first thing, so the primary outcome of the study is, is the drug safe and is it well tolerated? And then as a secondary outcome, we looked at a whole lot of other things. So, as I said, and this drug is very widely used, around 250,000 people with HIV take it. Quite a number of hundreds of people that we look after in, in the clinic take it. So we've got a lot of experience with this drug. So what we looked at is the fact that uh, the people in the trial Okay, so the trial is now just finished, like this week. And it's complex. And we have a lot of data, which is also complex. And essentially, we have nobody to analyse the data, which is another issue. But what we know is that of the people on the trial, they're about the, the average age that you would see people with motor neurone disease, reasonable weight. We know that. Um, most people who enter trials are about two years from onset of symptoms, about a year from diagnosis, it takes about a year from onset of symptoms to diagnose people. So these people that we've got in the trial are, are reasonably typical of people with motor neurone disease and about 60%, 65% males and about 33% females. So the primary outcome is that nobody uh, had drug-related serious adverse events. So initially, the drug is safe. And nobody withdrew from the trial because of tolerability issues. I mean, clearly people with motor neurone disease have lots of other problems, but looking at them in detail, we couldn't find people that clearly withdrew because of tolerability. So the primary outcome of the study, very importantly, is that this drug is safe and well tolerated in people with, uh, with motor neurone disease. Also, during the trial, people on the trial, nobody died, except there were two people who withdrew very early in the trial after only taking one or two doses of the drug and they unfortunately progressed and passed away. So the problem at the end of the trial was that the company that uh, produces this drug did give us the Trimec for free. And that was, I guess you could say, generous. And at the end of the trial, they've now not agreed to continue to supply the patients on the trial. So people have had to buy some of the drug from overseas and import it, which is not really what would be ideal. So we're now looking at the secondary outcomes, which are clearly the outcomes that people are interested in. As Matthew quite rightly said, this is a phase two study. It didn't have a placebo. The outcomes can only be interpreted in a very limited sense. But we're more than a little bit uh, optimistic in what it might show. So we need to look at these a bit more in a more detail. But so that I can take you a little bit into my world, uh, just looking at the ALS functional rating scale, 
uh, what you can see is just a jumble. So you've got some people who, who started high and stabilised, you've got some people who seem to have gone down, you've got some people who, who may have gone up a little bit. You've got a, a lot of different results. So all I can tell you is that I've got these pieces of this puzzle. I've got the ALS functional rating scale here, I've got the neurophysiology here, I've got survival here, I've got other things here, and I've got to try to piece these pieces of this complex puzzle together to try to find out what does somebody look like who benefited or may have benefited from this drug. There clearly is with every every drug. Not everybody benefits. Some people do, some people are intermediate and some people don't. So who are the people that benefited and what do they look like? Because they may then be the people who we could enrol in a further study, which may be a placebo controlled study, and actually see uh, whether this is effective. And we need to look at survival. All I can say is that looking at our cohort, we would have expected a number of people to have passed away during the trial, and we didn't see that. It may be due to a whole range of reasons that we've got to look at, but I guess that gives me a sense of, of some optimism as to associating what may be a cause and an outcome but I'll let you know. So all I wanted to do to finish is to thank uh, the, uh, more than anything, the people uh, who participated in the trial. I don't know whether there are people who participated in the trial here. Uh, importantly, the clinical trial nurses at each of the sites, because they really made it all happen under the leadership of uh, the four co-principal investigators who are all in this uh, together. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.